welcome everybody to our third gem analytics expert speaker series uh today we so uh quick introduction my name is david lotion i am the program director for the master of information management program uh and also the game entertainment and media analytics Ma uh, professional master's degree program here at the College of Information Studies at University of Maryland. And this is our third uh, uh, session in our uh, industry speaker series. Today, we have the uh, the opportunity to speak, to listen to uh, uh, Emre Ruhi from Respawn. He's an, a, uh, an analyst at Respawn. And I think I'm going to let him introduce himself a little bit more. But, and he's going to talk about data utility and video games how Respawn uses data. So we're gonna uh, listen to Emre, uh, please put your questions into the uh, Q&A or into the chat area. And uh, uh, when Emre's done talking, we will do a little bit of, a, of an introduction to the uh, Game Entertainment and Media Analytics Professional Master's Degree Program. And then we're gonna have some time for answering questions about the talk or answering questions about the program. So uh, Emre, can we... Uh, I'm going to hand it off to you. Why don't you share your screen and we can uh, move right. forward from there. Thank you so much and welcome. Yeah. All right. Well, first of all, I just want, before I share my screen, just want to say hi to everybody. Uh, my name is Emery. Um, uh, I am uh, very excited to uh, go through the um, uh, some of the fun stuff that we've been doing with data at Respawn and with video games today. Um, I've got a talk here that's going to, um, let's say, uh, if I go, if I speed run it, it'll be like a, like a 20 minute talk. If I extend it a little bit, like, let's say like half an hour. Um, but then, uh, we'll have time for questions and, uh, feel free to, um, throw questions into the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on it, but it is, um, tough to both go through the, the deck and keep an eye on the chat. So maybe we'll, we'll uh, if I miss anything, we'll definitely, um, have time at the end to, to go over that, so yeah, we'll, we'll um, that, just to interrupt for a second. We'll we'll collect all the questions and we'll we'll bundle them up for the end. Okay. Okay, we'll do that at the end. All right. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let me let me share my screen here. Um, boom. All right. So the uh, the uh, I, guess, I guess the just to to get us started here. Um, I'm a senior business and gameplay analyst at Respawn. Respawn is a game um, developer uh, as opposed to a game publisher. Um, our game publisher, our what you would call, if you ever watched uh, last week tonight, our business daddy is uh, EA, so Electronic Arts. Electronic Arts is a game publisher. Um, and you can think of it as like uh, a game developer or a, um, a, a studio like Respawn is the, the team that is... Um, kind of you could think of as, as like the author of a book and then like uh, EA would be like uh, I don't know like Penguin like the publisher of the book like the folks that distribute those out there right so um, when you think of the relationship between studio and um, kind of publisher that's kind of, that's a little bit how that goes I was a bit confused about that in fact when I got hired um, I, I applied to a game at or, or to a job at Respawn but my paychecks come from a company, Electronic Arts. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit, uh, a little bit confusing. It takes a little bit to learn, but that's kind of how, how it goes. Um, I am part of the uh, part of Respawn, and my, like I said, my title, Senior Business and Gameplay Analyst. And today, what we're going to talk about are the uh, analytics and uh, the data science of video games. So what we're going to cover, like I said, um, quick sixty seconds about me. Uh, I want to give you some examples of the scale of our data. Um, so when it comes to the uh, w w the data that comes out of a video game or when it comes to having a data team, if you have a data team, the assumption is that you, have, you also have a, uh, a whole lot of actual data, right? So I want to give you guys a little bit of a sense of what big data means and what the uh, scale of big data actually looks like. Um, then I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a sense of how the um, how a data team actually can help with video game design, which is a something that I had no idea about. Um, 
uh, I will give you a little bit of a sense of the job requirements. So at, part of my role uh, at Respawn is as a hiring manager. Um, so I have a good sense of what it takes to get a job at, at, as uh, on a data team. So if anywhere from uh, data engineering to data science to data analytics, and I will break those down a little bit for you guys uh, as well. Um, and uh, on top of that, like uh, product management, when it comes to the data side, these are all kind of elements that our team hires for. Um, and we have certain, you know, like uh, requirements and like things that a uh, couple of tips and tricks that I'll, that I'll throw your way. Um, and what I hope that you'll unlock from my talk today is going to be what it's like uh, and what it takes to be part of a game dev team. Um, the kind of challenges and problems that we face on a regular basis. So uh, if you're a video game player um, of any sort, right? So like you, you could be just, I only play Candy Crush on my phone all the way to, um, you know, like I've got 2000 hours in Apex Legends um, or more, you know, like th there's a wide range of who considers themselves uh, like a video game player. But um, from that perspective, it's kind of rare to actually um, get a sense of, hey, from the player side, I kind of see the decisions that a game team is making. And I see like, okay, you guys added this to the game. You took this out of the game. What went into that? Like uh, a lot of times the thing that we don't see and the thing that I hope to kind of give a little bit of a sense of today is uh, the behind the scenes like considerations that have to be done before we actually can throw something into the, a game. Um, it's particularly interesting because for Apex Legends, uh, Apex Legends is a live service. So what that means is that the game, <laughs> launching the game was only the beginning of, of developing the game. Um, the game is continuously being updated. And what really what that means from a, like a human perspective is that we are just constantly making decisions, right? So the, um, the volume and the uh, importance of the decisions that we make uh, are a lot, you know, at a much larger scale for a live service as opposed to, for example, uh, Jedi Fallen Order, which was a game that we released um, from Respawn, but it's not a live service. It's a game that you buy it on, on and we, we might patch it, but we're not uh, continuously updating it. There isn't like a, a uh, an ongoing battle pass that, that allows you to, you know, kind of uh, stay up to date with all the new releases and all these um, kind of uh, ongoing elements and features of the game. Um, when you have a live service, you also have, like I said, you just have this influx of decision making that needs to be done. A data team person like myself, um, if we are good at our job, the thing that we are really helping us do is make those decisions. So we make the decisions um, more quickly and we can make decisions with more confidence and then we can move on. Cause really you don't have a lot of redos uh, when it comes to a live service, right? So like if we add, if we launch a new season and we have a new character in the game, a new legend in the game, um, that legend is going in the game. What we are, <laughs> what we need to then do is uh, monitor it, see if it, if it is balanced the way we want um, the, uh, and kind of whether or not reality, um, when something that we put in the game is is kind of embraced by players, whether that reality matches our uh, design intent, right? So the thing that we intended to do um, versus the thing that we actually did. <laughs> um, sometimes those are not exactly the same. And, and it, also interestingly, there is a time delay between releasing something and actually getting the kind of data that you would say is representative of what's actually going on. So when we when we actually uh, release something into the game, the initial reaction of something that goes into a game versus what players think about that a week later or 10 days later, very different. So you could launch something on day one and all the reports and all the things that you hear about something that went into a game, it's broken, it's uh, overpowered, it's underpowered, this will never be viable, um, I can't use this, this is different. You know, those are the sort of, uh, I would say, maybe the expected um, uh, reactions from uh, putting something new into a 
popular competitive battle royale like Apex Legends. Um, however, if you wait about 10 days, what you'll find is that players have actually learned what it is that we as game devs have been uh, playing with for months. So it's, it's a little bit, uh, uh, it, it's, I would say it's important to remember that anything that goes into a, a video game from the developer's side is something that we've been playing with for months and, and we are quite familiar with. And we have already gone through that, um, that uh, learning curve and we've already learned the, uh, or we've kind of already uh, gotten past that, that, that uh, how do we actually use this? What's the point of it and all of that. Players on the other hand are seeing something for the very, very first time. And it's important for us on the developer side and the data side to remember that there is a discrepancy between um, there's a learning curve, right? So there's a time where we need to actually wait. Even if we are getting data, that data is still, uh, I would say, premature, right? So uh, we don't want to make rash decisions. It's very, very easy to make uh, uh, rash decisions based off of Reddit posts or tweets or um, just uh, your own experience jumping in a game and seeing like, oh, I just got wrecked by this new new legend. Um, that must mean that this new legend is too powerful. Perhaps, I'm not saying that that's wrong, but one of the things that we also do is um, kind of uh, provide a little bit of a buffer for our decision-making teams across the studio to kind of, let's see what happens, right? So the, uh, we, we, we kind of provide that, that uh, excuse or the, um, kind of, uh, we give folks a reason to, to not necessarily need to jump in and make a decision because we know historically that the uh, initial sentiment with a game release and uh, that same sentiment only a few days or a week later really do change. So um, that's kind of what we're gonna be covering and what I hope you're gonna get out of this. And I'm, uh, I, I think you can tell I'm excited to talk about this stuff. This is a um, kind of a rare opportunity. I'm, I, I, uh, big shout out, thank you to David for uh, putting this all together and to UMD. Um, this is a video game decision making and the behind the scenes of how game dev works. It doesn't always, we, we don't always get to actually uh, share this stuff. So uh, I'm stoked to do it. And uh, yeah, let's, let's keep on going. So quickly about me, like I said, <laughs> my name is Emery. Uh, my gamer tag, Emre, is uh, kind of what I had come up with as a way to pronounce my name. I'm from Turkey. Um, uh, and my family, I think, is probably in this chat. Um, my, my dad's a professor at UMD. And uh, um, so the, the, just a real quick about me, I went to UVA for my undergrad. Um, I worked on a startup afterward that was related to, uh, we, were, we, we, we became the uh, merchandisers for a bunch of esports teams like Team Liquid and CLG. Um, this was back during StarCraft II being the biggest esport. So if you can imagine how long ago that was, if you're a video game player, um, I've been a gamer my whole life. Uh, I like uh, some of my best friends. I met them by playing like uh, Diablo and um, some of these uh, like Diablo two and like uh, Brood War, um, some old games. Um, so I've been a gamer and been involved in games for a long time. Um, after my startup adventures at, uh, after UVA, I decided I should probably learn something about business. Uh, and I got my MBA. I went to Georgetown for that up in DC. Instead of getting a real job, we accidentally started another startup there. This time, again, related to video games, we, we built a, uh, a coaching tool that was related, it was very much related to uh, the data and the um, kind of the application of data to video game problems. And the, the, the tool that we built is something we called Sidekick. And Sidekick was a a little uh, AI based coach that would uh, help you play League of Legends. And that was the, the purpose of that. Um, that actually got me um, uh, in through the door at Blizzard. Um, and my first video game job at a real studio or a real video game company that wasn't something I created was after my MBA, after um, going into a little bit of uh, startup venture again, um, was at Blizzard. So I moved from the East Coast all the way over here to the West Coast. I will say that um, the, uh, if you, so I'm talking to a whole bunch of UMD students and folks from uh, Maryland. Uh, 
if you get a chance to explore jobs on the West Coast, highly recommend it. Um, for example, we went surfing this weekend. Um, it's December. Um, this is one of the small benefits of being out here on the West Coast. It's a great place. Also, one of the things that I wasn't familiar with when I was doing my education at uh, on the East Coast was the number of really cool video game related jobs that exist out here on the West Coast. On the East Coast, there are a couple of game studios. There's Bethesda, which is in Maryland, uh, named after Bethesda, right? There is uh, Epic Games. Epic Games makes the Unreal Engine, Fortnite, um, the, a whole bunch of stuff. They are down in North Carolina. Um, but other than that, and then there's, I, I think Rockstar Games has a, a, a studio in New York. Um, but other than that, the uh, a, a whole bunch of the video game studios happen to be over here on the West Coast. Um, and the as a result, a lot of the jobs related to video games sometimes can be uh, um, less less known, right? So one thing that's important to remember is a video game studio is just like any other business, they're gonna need um, all sorts of talent, right? Anything from, yeah, you're gonna need the game design folks, you're gonna need the art team, you're gonna need animation, you're gonna need you know the mocap folks that do the rigging that you're gonna need, all of that, but you also need marketing, you need, um, to have uh, your brand um, like uh, teams, you're gonna need your corporate partnerships, you're gonna need your data team, right? So you're gonna need your data scientists and your uh, analysts and your engineers. And just like anything that is required of any other kind of company, it's analogous in a video game studio. So um, if, you, if you thought, like I might've thought that, hey, is there a place for me in video games? Well, maybe not necessarily in the super creative, like. Uh, the uh, in the game design field, if you haven't had any background in that, maybe that is, isn't the exact right direction, but immediately adjacent to that, in fact, you sit right next to them and you work on the same problems, there's the data team, there's the marketing team, there's the publishing team, there's all sorts of other teams that require a little bit more of a traditional background that I, I would encourage you to look at. So I was at Blizzard for uh, about a year and a half, and then uh, on the Global Insights team, very cool team. Blizzard has a really strong uh, data uh, culture. Um, so anything from the Hearthstone meta to um, balance in Overwatch to um, the uh, how are the different maps of StarCraft balanced for the different races that are playing the game. Um, those are all the, those all are questions that the data team gets to answer. So it's a really really cool uh, organization. Um, and so from there I went to Respawn, um, at Respawn, my, my, uh, role is really, I came in as the main, uh, I guess the first person in the studio that was actually working on data directly. So, um, my team in the studio is really the hub of a whole bunch of questions. So, um, you can think of the data team within the studio as kind of an internal consulting team and, uh, if you have a question related to either the gameplay uh, side of things or the business side of things, and you've kind of exhausted all of the different tools that you have um, to solve those those questions, um, sometimes you find that, hey, you know what? Maybe I should go to the data team and see like if I can get an answer from uh, parsing through like, let's say like 10 million players worth of data to come to an answer instead of going with like, hey, how did you feel about this? Or taking like one or two anecdotes here and there, um, we can take a step back and use the data as a different tool and a different approach to um, solving problems. So we are a uh, another set of tools that are used in the development process of games. Um, and the, uh, the, the domain that we really cover is anything from the business side of the game. So the how much money is this game making side of the game uh, to the, is this game fun? And uh, are we creating like an engaging product, like something that people really like to play? And um, I, I like both sides of it. My NBA side likes the, the, the business side a little bit, but my gamer origins really like the, the design side. So um, let's talk a little bit about the, about the data here. Um, now this is our Pathfinder. So, um, 
like I said, I was gonna give you a little bit of a sense of the scale of the data. And this is a, a, a bit of an older slide, actually. This, this is, a, um, I think maybe you could multiply these numbers out by like two or three at this point and still be correct. But if you wanna uh, get a sense of how much data comes out of a game like Apex Legends, and when we talk about big data, uh, we've got almost two trillion rows of data. Um, if you wanted to uh, try to open up Excel and hold and hold the data that that comes out of Apex, uh, you would need to open up 500,000.exe versions of Excel, each one maxed out to hold only a, a, about a percent of the data. So what that means is that the uh, there's way too much data that comes out of this game that <laughs> that, um, that you could actually parse using using Excel. Excel is not gonna get you there. Um, Excel will uh, perhaps be useful in some scenarios, but in my day to day, um, Excel is really not a tool that we we really touch, right? So, in order to make sense of data at this scale, we need to use a couple of different kinds of tools, right? So. Uh, just to give you a sense of how this actually works, uh, at the end of a given game of Apex Legends, so if you play Apex or if you play pretty much uh, a whole bunch of other games work in the same way, um, throughout the game, the things that you're doing in the game, like you drop a weapon, you pick something up, you, you shoot a, a weapon, you capture a point, you, um, you die or you get revived, oops, um, something like that, uh, the... The, the game at, throughout that process is actually capturing all that data and it's packaging it up. At the end of the game, that data gets fired off uh, to our data warehouse. And the process of actually piping the data from, from the game to a, uh, a place where the data is actually useful is the uh, purview and the, the domain of our data engineers. Data engineers are the folks that are um, like they are, they, they tend to be a little bit more behind the scenes, but they are mission critical for anything that I do or anything that anybody does with the data. So they're the ones that get the data to where it needs to go. They are um, turning it from this like gross, unstructured mess of like a JSON package that is like kind of got like little bits. It's got all the information you, you need, but it's in, in no way is it, is it useful for like a human to read. Um, it is very compressed and very efficient. The data engineers are taking that, they're parsing it out, they're, they're putting it into nice columns. They are making sure that it's uh, consistent and reliable and uh, that it is there every day, right? Um, that data, when it goes to our data warehouse, now it can actually be um, kind of uh, from a data warehouse, you can think of that as like the inventory, right? Like that's where all of the, um, the raw materials are, are, are living. Uh, what we do from a, a data warehouse is we can then build out what you would imagine as a data store or a data mart. Um, so you can imagine like a, a, a grocery store um, is the end user, right? It's like the place you go to actually go pick up your, your, your milk and your cereal and all that stuff. That, those raw materials came from a warehouse further upstream. Um, and the, uh, the data marts that we build would be something like, uh, daily, like a daily gameplay. So all the, uh, we'll have like tables and, um, data structures that tell us specifically about like, uh, um, all of the games that occurred in our ranked mode. Um, so instead of having a table that has like every bit of information about every single thing that happened in across apex, which is like. We, we have those, but we don't really need to hit that table up for any information if the thing that we're looking for is um, like uh, how many players played ranked today. Well, that information actually lives in a particular uh, data store, data mart. So we have this kind of uh, uh, raw, you know, the, uh, the telemetry that comes out of the game, it gets piped to our warehouse, and then we build data models that are, um, that model the, the, information that's in these warehouses and they turn them into something that is useful and readable and digestible on a, a, a human basis and like um, it, it kind of makes sense. So you, you can say, okay, this table, I get it. This is like uh, uh, gonna tell me all of the 
um, battle pass level ups that happen today. So what I can do is I can look at whether or not something that we changed in, let's say in uh, our battle pass progression today, did that actually uh, hinder or um, promote a, a, a lot more or a lot less players than we expected. So let's say we made a change that made it easier to level up throughout our battle pass. If I wanted to check that in our data, I can actually go to a specific table that's designed to tell me about battle pass progression and just query that. And when I say query that, that brings me to, to another thing, which is um, about the technical chops. So this, this is a, um, a little bit about the required loadout um, for a, a role on the data team. And the technical chops that I'm gonna tell you a little bit about is really, it comes down to, you're gonna need to know SQL, SQL, right? Um, the, the tool that we use to actually query and to pull out a, um, a, a subset of the information out of this huge amount of data, we can't use Excel, we can't um, eyeball it. <laughs> um, so what we need to do is we need to actually uh, write a little bit of, of, of code and that, that really falls in the SQL domain. So if you're gonna be getting a job at, at a, at a uh, on a data team, regardless of whether it's on video games or if it's at, let's say it's at Netflix or if it's at Amazon or if it's at Deloitte or whatever, a data team um, a person is going to be expected, I believe for the most part, almost certainly gonna be expected to know how to write some SQL, some SQL. Um, in fact, for our roles, um, even from the most junior role, like right out of, uh, right out of college, um, and even for internships, we do a, uh, a bit of a SQL screening, right? Like the technical, uh, test that you'll be expected to pass is whether or not you can actually query the data because before you can actually use any of your excellent domain knowledge and you're really like, um, you know, you're like, uh, uh, excellent, like presentation skills and your communication ability before any of that, you're going to need to get the data out of the game, right? So you're going to need to have this querying ability. And in fact, it's even useful for, uh, like program managers. Um, we have folks that are, uh, designing, like, let's say somebody who is designing the challenge system in apex legends, they really want to know the impact of, let's say, um, the challenge system on retention in the game. Well, they could ask me um, how that went, but I've got a huge list of stuff that I've got to do already, right? So I'm going to need to tell them something like, all right, well, we're in the middle of our sprint right now. Um, what about in two weeks? Let me, would that work? Maybe that'll work, but what might also work is if you are a program manager, you'll actually be able to go in and answer the question for yourself with uh, a little bit of that SQL knowledge. So I would really uh, recommend if you are looking into data, um, that is kind of the universal language. It's SQL, structured query language. Um, and it is, I would say, to get to the point where you can make sense of this stuff, like two weeks of, of hard work will, 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 get you, will get you a long way there. So. Um, you also need to have some domain knowledge and passion for the domain that you're working in. In any kind of data field, what I found in analytics field or data science field, uh, the, the technical skills that we have, like I can build a model, I can do like a predictive uh, time series, I can say like, hey, here's what I think is gonna happen based on what already happened. I can give you like a, a predictive uh, analysis, I can give you prescriptive analysis, so like what you should do. Um, all of those things actually rely on the, 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 the topic that I'm talking about, right? If I'm talking about video games, uh, I really should like video games. So when we get like folks that apply to jobs at, at my studio, so like our roles, I will give you a, just an idea, like one of our recent um, data analyst roles, I think at minimum, I think we closed the applications at like 400 applications that came in for that one role. It's a crazy amount of uh, uh, of competition that's coming in, a really easy way to uh, uh, kind of filter through this is to look at things like your passion for the, the field that you're working in. If you really don't like video games or if you don't play them very much, it's gonna be, 
I wouldn't say impossible, but I will say it's going to be really hard to uh, fully understand what it is that somebody um, on the other end is asking uh, and where they're coming from. If a game designer is coming at you and asking you about like, hey, I just tweaked this new weapon. Uh, I want to know the, um, the, the typical engagement distance that like uh, our new like sniper rifle uh, in the game actually, um, like w w at, at what distance do players usually use this weapon, right? This is a really uh, interesting question. The, the intent, of course, is gonna be long range, right? Because it's a sniper rifle, you would think that it's long range. You kind of wanna, if, you, if you're into video games, you really wanna ask like, uh, you, you're gonna have like a little bit of a different sense of the question at, as opposed to if you had no idea why somebody would care where the weapon is, like at what distance, the reason being, if uh, you find that people using the sniper rifle are using it from point blank range, well that as a gamer, you could say, hey, that's weird, that's wrong. Um, and that kind of already gives you a, a bit of a head start um, to uh, answering a bunch of these questions. So I would say that domain knowledge, super important. And then being like interested in this information. Like I, when I was applying for this uh, role, I had offers that were very similar roles at like a bunch of the big fan companies. Um, and the the uh, when it comes down to making the decision, I'm a lot more interested in thinking about like uh, um, the business of a video game as opposed to the business of let's say like uh, Amazon Prime, right? Like uh, which is something that requires a lot of data and needs a lot of data skills and a lot of passion. They they get paid a huge amount of money. It's a great job. However, I I just don't care about it as much as I do about video games, right? So. This is the kind of things that come come uh, come into effect when you're thinking about it, um, like thinking about different roles. Ability to communicate. You're gonna uh, as a uh, data team member, a lot of the um, the hard work is done behind the scenes. Then you come down to a really like a let's say you, you set up like a 30 minute Zoom call with a, a stakeholder that you haven't talked to in like a week, and the whole point is. Hey, in this 30 minutes, not only do I need to tell you that what I did was legit and like the, the methodology I used to come to this answer mathematically or statistically is going to make sense. Not only do I need to kind of uh, make sure that you and I are on the same page there, I need to get to the point, answer your question and leave time for you to answer and ask me questions so I can tweak my follow ups. Right. So the communication ability from both a really high level, like let's say you're gonna go uh, talk with a whole bunch of other data scientists. Now they're gonna wanna ask you your, the what was the P value and the, the, you know, they're gonna ask you like your confidence intervals and they're gonna get real nitty gritty technical math uh, on you. You're, being able to chat with those folks is one thing. Being able to chat with the studio executives or the C-suite of EA, which is something that we are required to do. Um, is another thing, right? So like uh, we are the folks that pull the investor metrics that are heard during the um, quarterly investor calls. So when I, he I hear Andrew Wilson, like our CEO, talking about Apex Legends, he's almost directly reading a line that I emailed to the uh, exec uh, board about our recent quarter. So um, being able to actually get that communication down, that's another element of this role being savvy about the business and then being savvy about the so what element of, of this role. So what that, what I mean by that is the, after doing all this work, can I boil something down to a, hey, so what? So like you found something out, what was the whole point of this? Um, what do we, what can we um, take moving forward? Cause we're gonna be making, a, a, right after you've answered this question about today's decision, well, tomorrow we've got another one it's important to know whether today's information actually helps us answer tomorrow's question. So um, that's so what element really, really important. It really comes down to, uh, can you boil down a really complex thing into a couple of kind of uh, digestible takeaways? Um, and that is something that comes with uh, uh, practice. I, I have done this wrong many times. I have thought that the the, the takeaway is one thing, and then I will go deep into that one avenue and then realize that, oh man, I, I, <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> Turns out these guys wanted to know something totally different. 
Um, and that is a part of the learning experience here. So um, moving along, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of like cool charts that I've made here. And we're gonna go through these pretty quickly, but just as a, 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 an idea, um, we had a character that we released called Revenant. Revenant can move while crouched uh, at, at the same speed as any other player can move while they're standing. So the, uh, the idea would be that, or the, the assumption would be that players that play Revenant are actually gonna be crouching and walking around while crouched a lot longer than uh, any other character. Is that true? Uh, well, here's a chart. And what we can see is, yes, uh, while other, other characters that do not have the speed boost um, spend about 3% of their time crouch walking, Revenant players do that at about double the um, frequency. So right away, when we're talking to the design and we're saying, hey, here's, here's like something uh, related to the abilities of this new character, are players embracing it? Are they... Um, going the direction that we expect, yes. The answer here would be yes. So um, here's here's another chart. This is uh, one of my favorites uh, because it actually uh, is an example of what you can do when you have like a bajillion Lorozo data. So in this case, 630 million pings. Pings in this case are communications between players. What I'm doing when I ping somebody is I I'm pulling up a little menu on my screen and I'm saying, uh, and I'm picking a pre-made communication thing. It's basically like a, like a, a message that's already written. Like, Hey, let's go here. Uh, I'm hurt. Help me. Um, uh, let me help you, you know, all sorts of different things like that. When we look at the, um, the tendencies of what players are actually saying using that ping wheel throughout a game from the beginning of a game to the end of a game, we can actually find some really cool trends. So for example, at the beginning of a game, the most important communication that we find players are doing relate to where we're gonna go and where, they're, uh, where they can find um, uh, enemies. From there, as the game progresses, once you've kind of like settled and you're, you're, you're sure you've landed on the, on the map and you're sure you're not gonna die, now the question is, where's their loot? So about halfway through the game, the communications kind of move toward like finding the best items and then as we move toward the end, again, it comes down to uh, survival and where the enemies are. And what we can do is we can actually take a whole bunch of different communication um, data points and compress them down into something that is representing a whole lot of players and a whole lot of games and uh, really show the, the trend in like a, a simple way. So this is like one of my favorite charts because um, it, it is... Uh, it takes a lot of complicated stuff and it boils it down to something kind of, you know, both useful it, it, and interesting and uh, like from a technical basis, it worked, which is for me kind of cool. Um, so th this is a, a sense of how, how pings work. Here's a, uh, <laughs> here's a, a type of question that we might get that uh, is gonna get the data team involved with something. So. We'll, we'll get somebody, uh, one of my like uh, coworkers will send me a message on Slack that says, hey, did you see this, this thread on Reddit? It says something like, there's no armor on this map. We, we are sure that there's armor on this map. What we are also sure of though, is that players have not learned where the armor is on the new map yet, especially when compared to uh, the amount of knowledge they have about the previous map, which they, every nook and cranny of that map they've already deciphered. Um, when we, we launch a new map, we're gonna get something like this. So this is a, uh, uh, I, would, I would say a, um, one of those, uh, be warned, you're gonna get like this kind of high anxiety, high pressure, oh my God, did we forget to put armor on this map kind of question. And as a data team member, one of the things that is gonna be your responsibility is to say, hey, I looked at reality, I looked at millions of games, and it turns out we got armor on this map. Don't worry about it. Um, we, we not only found it, but uh, players are finding it at the same rate as they did at the beginning of the last map that we launched, for example, right? Um, so you are uh, not only there to um, validate design intent and to make sure that the business models are working, you're also there to uh, uh, alleviate any worries that might pop up. 
Um, here is a cool little uh, uh, GIF that I put together of a, um, so this is what you would call spatial analytics. This is something that you also get to do if you work on a data team. If you have uh, X, Y, Z coordinates of every player, what you can do is you can actually map this out on a map, right? So you can actually create things like heat maps and uh, look at things like um, uh, the different kinds of um, interactions that happen um, from like a bird's eye view. The cool thing on this map, so each color on, on this is a, what I did was I took the, the winning the winning team from, I think, five or six different games, and I overlaid only the, the path that the winning squad took in their game. So what this tells us is, um, at a really quick glance, you can win a game of Apex Legends pretty much across the map. There isn't like a, a known region of the map that is gonna be conducive to winning all the time. In fact, you can be a team that range is really far and comes back and go you know it takes like a big like loop around the map those teams uh can win you can have a team that is very uh camp oriented and they like to stay where they land um and they don't like to venture too far those teams also have the ability to win based on different conditions of the game uh, so there are different kinds of uh tools we can use to answer different kinds of questions this was one that i think Nobody really asked me to make this. This was more of a, I wonder if I can make this um, thing. Um, and after I made it and showed some of the design team, the result was that we got a whole bunch of questions that were sparked by the type of analysis that we can do. So once you've kind of uh, unveiled to your team that you've got this uh, ability to answer a question using, let's say, heat maps, you're gonna get a whole bunch of heat map related questions coming down through the door. So uh, it's important <laughs> to uh, be, be, you know, while you are a very capable, uh, you know, UMD grad who's got all the skills necessary to, to answer all sorts of questions, sometimes, you know, for your own sanity, you're gonna to wanna to limit it a little bit so that you're not always under the gun answering a whole bunch of questions. So this is one uh, that I thought was cool. Here is a, uh, an example of uh, a deliverable I made using spatial analytics. This is for one of our uh, one of our, our dev teams, um, one of my my colleague my coworkers. Uh, what I did here was just for uh, during the last anniversary, as a kind of a keepsake, I sent out a, a message saying, "Hey, anybody who wants like a, a a gift from the data team, message message me. As long as you're okay with me pulling your data." Um, uh, I, I will give me a couple of days and I'm gonna give you something back that's cool. The thing that I gave back was uh, a kind of a, 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 not really a poster, but like a little like a flyer that described the very first public game that these guys played uh, in Apex. So you can imagine you're developing a game in secret, uh, playing only with like your own, your own coworkers, and then you release the game to the world and you play your, your first game in public. That's like a, uh, you know, a milestone, right? That's like a special day, a special game, a game that you have actually no ability to capture um, in any like, like uh, reasonable way. So what we did was we went back and we said, okay, what was Joby's very first game of Apex? Let's pull it. Let's pull some of the stats. He only got one count. He placed third in that game. It was a nail biter. Uh, we show like where he went. And then this was like a little gift of course this is not useful for the business this is not useful for um really anybody but joby but uh when we, we made a whole bunch of these for a whole bunch of different folks and what it did was uh it was more of like an advertisement for the data team like hey check out what the data team can do and um allowed us to kind of flex our creative muscles a little bit as well so you do get a chance to do that and to uh it's not all uh, statistics and, you know, normal distribution, and, like all that hard stuff. You can do some fun stuff too. So that really, uh, brings me to the end of my talk today. Um, really appreciated, uh, the time. Thank you. Um, yeah. And, and that, that's it for me. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks, Emre. Uh, I'm going to, to, we've got a lot of questions. 
So I'm going to do a quick uh, overview of our program, and then we're going to dive into it. We'll pick, cherry pick some of these questions. And what we'll do is I will try to collect them all and send them to you, and maybe we can do a, uh, an offline uh, kind of interview to try to cover the rest of those, because there are some really good questions here. But one thing that I do want to do is talk a, a little bit about our uh, Master of Professional Studies in Game, Entertainment, and Media Analytics, and uh, what was really nice about what Emre was saying is, is that it really kind of covers uh, to a large degree what we intended to, to help train students to do uh, in terms of, of targeting the type of jobs that, uh, that they, can, they can slide into with this type of degree. So why did we put this, this program together? Well, well, there's no business like show business. Uh, I've got a couple of, uh, tweet, uh, of uh, pointers here from some, some articles and some reports. Uh, there's a projection that the annual global global entertainment revenues would increase from 2.1 trillion to 2.6 trillion in 2023. There's over 164 million adults in the United States that are playing video games. That's that is that is practically half of the population total population of the United States. Uh, some new uh, some new stats that I that I uh, dredged up: video game and esports revenues have reached $147 billion in 2020 with a 5.7 uh, compound annual growth rate uh, to expand to almost 200 billion in 2025. Streaming video on demand, which is not games, but it is certainly another aspect of our gem analytics uh, uh, environment expected to grow at a double digit rate through 2025, et cetera. So it, why is this important? Well, these companies are all competing for your attention and for, for their customers. And the time that they spend watching TV is time that they're not spending playing games. The time they're, not, they're playing games and the times they're not uh, streaming video on their handheld machines, et cetera. So, so there is not a lot of time that is allocated. These different companies want to be able to attract consumers and retain those consumers so that it can turn into something where it's mutual benefit for the, the customers, they have a great experience, and it generates revenues for the companies themselves. So in our program, we looked at, at you know, what are the important critical aspects of, of the types of analytics that a professional individual in the game and entertainment and media industries would want to know. And we have a, a, a we, we reached out to a bunch of experts like Emre and some of our other speakers that we had on our prior talks uh, to get their insights about what we should be uh, uh, training students to be able to be aware of. And so what we've done is put together a specialty program that focuses on application use of information management, analytics, and data science for understanding customer and player behaviors, for improving the experience, for maximizing customer lifetimes, therefore, therefore maximizing customer lifetime value, to understand uh, how to map game topographies like that uh, image that Emre just showed and how that can influence game design. And all at the same time, uh, maintaining attention to the need to protect private customer data. That is a, a, a continuing and growing uh, set of concerns. So what will you learn if you uh, join this, the GEM analytics program? Uh, it's structured to provide a holistic overview of the use of analytics specifically within the game and entertainment industry. So you'll learn about the entertainment industries, game industries, <clears throat> the analytics or data science life cycle, uh, how to do problem solving in the context of what we've learned about how the industries work. We'll learn about <clears throat> customer profiling and analytics, retention analysis, game telemetry, compliance issues around data privacy, fairness, uh, data ethics, as well as inclusion, equity, and diversity within the game and entertainment context. And uh, it was great because Emory, you shared some thoughts about, about the types of jobs that graduates of this program might be able to do. Uh, I did a quick survey. I came up with at the very least these types of titles, data analysts for game analytics, game analysts and business intelligence, game data scientists, uh, game tech solutions architect, manager of data engineering, a uh, lead data scientist. These were all job listings that were relatively current uh, with what I'm showing you right now. And uh, these were the specific titles that we that we pulled out. Uh, so if you want to learn more about this program, I put the link into the chat. If you go to iSchool.umt.edu slash gem, that's Game Entertainment and Media Analytics, uh, you will get to be able to see an overview of the program, uh, the curriculum, the types of courses that we teach, and uh, the, the learn about uh, uh, the completely online 
program that we have. So now while we, uh, while we are uh, uh, still have some time, we got, we got lots and lots of questions. I'm going to jump into one that came, came relatively early. Uh, that was one that, that Emory, that you and I were trying to chatting about a little bit before we started. Uh, what are some ways you measure if a game is fun to its players? Oh man, that's a, so fun, fun is a fantastic, uh, it's a great, it's a great question. So we, we, we measure fun in two different ways. So one way that we do it is by uh, coming up with a proxy stat that would say, if this number goes up or down, it's going to tell us something about the fun of the game. So for example, uh, retention. So how, how, like, are we keeping players playing our game? If we are doing a good job or um, if we, whatever decision we've made in the game is, is fun, we would expect that our retention number either stays the same or goes up. It doesn't go down, right? Like we would, if we were losing retention, we could say that we are dropping our fun levels. Another way we do it is directly asking players. And at the end of a small, so we have a, a random uh, uh, survey that goes out to a very small percentage of our players at the end of a match. And it straight up asks a very basic question. Hey, did you have fun this game? Uh, yes or no? The What we do is with the yes or no, we also then have the uh, what they did in the game itself, right? So we know what they how they placed in the game. Uh, did they get any kills? Did they die early? Did their team help them? Did they pick up any cool weapons? Uh, you know, what happened in the game? And then if we get a whole bunch of those uh, uh, results, we can actually come up with like trends and say something like uh, players tend to say they have fun if they place at least 10th place out of 20 um, in, a, in a game of Apex Legends. Or the likelihood of somebody saying they had fun is almost zero if they never if they don't get any kills. Um, and with that information, we can then make design decisions that uh, are more conducive to having fun. So that that's uh, that that's uh, the quick the quick answer there for that. But but it's it's a uh, it's really the core of what we do, and really the everything else follows from the fun, right? Like if you can't if the game is not fun, having a really cool battle pass or a really cool like uh, skins in the game or really like uh, like awesome like uh, social system all that other stuff kind of doesn't matter as much if the fun isn't there so the fun has to be there before everything else follows so um, it's a crucial question it's a really good one uh thanks that was a, that was a, that was a very interesting question i'm gonna pop into another one uh how do you balance the demand for both professional players and casual players when looking at the data uh, the meta for both player bases is very different from an outside perspective. It appears that casual or new players are more interested in the game being fun, but balance is almost more important to people who play Apex competitively as their job. Yeah, that's a man. That's a really good question too. Uh, <laughs> so the uh, for the most part, our designers are trying to design the team the game for high level play. However, the overall intent is to have a game that is appealing to new players as well as really high skilled players. So the interesting thing about Apex is that the, there is a extremely wide skill range in this game. The uh, Anybody who, who, once you think you're like, even if you're in the Apex Predator, which is the very highest ranked tier of, of Apex, even in that, uh, that cohort, the uh, range of players from like the really like the top level of apex predators and the beginning level of apex predator those are like two different types of players in terms of skill the they they would be um the the higher level predators would would crush the lower level in in terms of skill because the they, they've just gotten that good um what we try to do is design the game so that it is has that competitive integrity it's fun to play if you're really good it's not uh doesn't have any like uh um, kind of like, it's not very gimmicky. It's actually, um, it's, it's merit-based. So it's, it's about, it's rewarding you for getting good. Um, there are games where, um, the reward is only for playing the game, like putting in the time. Our game, it doesn't matter how much time you put in, you have to be getting, if you're, if you're getting good, you're going to be seeing the result. Um, so the, uh, we, we, we tend to look at the high level for design um, 
balance, but we also keep a very strong, like close look at whether we are, uh, you know, uh, inadvertently, uh, dis- you know, creating like a disadvantage for new players. So making the game harder for new players, that's something that we would avoid doing. So it's a, it's a tough question. It's really comes down to like a case by case thing. Um, but really the, uh, if we can balance for the high level, we can then um, kind of flow down and make sure that it's it's still balanced at the lower levels as well. So that's the, at the moment that's kind of the way we look at it. But um, uh, it's it's a tough question, and it really comes down to kind of a case by case. Nice. I think we I think we have time for one more question. Sure. Although, uh, like I said, I think if we can capture all of these questions, uh, maybe we can do a an offline recording of uh, of asking them and getting some of the the answers as well. So I'm going to ask this last question. How many of your day-to-day skills did you know before starting at, at Blizzard <laughs> Respawn and how much did you learn on the job? <laughs> oh man. Um, so my, my, I, I, I knew how to do a presentation and how to, uh, I, I have a pretty good math, math background. Um, but when it comes to like writing SQL, and uh, actually parsing big data, I didn't have very much experience at all. I actually had to learn it um, before coming into uh, and taking my technical tests at Blizzard. Um, and not only learn it before, but learn it on the job. So I got, m- between starting and finishing, I got much better at, at writing SQL queries, for example. Um, but I would say that I, I knew enough to get the job, um, but I, definitely didn't know like um and i I think almost nobody could really know everything that goes into being good at this job before starting it so i would say from the technical side i knew a little bit of the sequel i knew a lot of stats and probability and math stuff just from my background and i had an mba so i knew like i could do the business talk and like presentation stuff pretty easily um importantly i also played a lot of video games so i could speak that language as well um, but the, from the technical side, I did learn a whole lot about SQL, Python, um, data, like um, warehousing and all that stuff. I learned that on the job. So, Well, uh, uh, I've, I've captured all these questions, so we're probably going to follow up with that. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the GEM analytics program, uh, go to uh, iSchool.umd.edu slash GEM. Uh, Emre, I, I really want to thank you. This was a great talk. You gave us a lot of information and covered a lot of space, uh, and reinforced uh, some of the some of the decisions that we've been making in in selecting the classes that go into this, especially when it comes to classes like data preparation for analytics and uh, information risk management and uh, data, introduction to data science and those types of classes. Uh, these are all uh, aligned with the, exactly the things that you said. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, within the next couple of years, you'll be uh, hiring our graduates instead of just talking to them. So thank you very much. And thank you for everybody that that attended. We will get a recording up on on the website. And so you can share that with your colleagues as well. So thank you. And I think this will be the end. Awesome. Thanks, guys.